Ryan Myers, thanks for joining us today, man. Yeah, man. Good to see you. Appreciate uh, the invitation. So uh, been looking forward to this. Yeah, just to continue the introduction to Ryan a little bit more, uh, Ryan and I work together at Craft CPAs here in Nashville, Tennessee for a couple of years, uh, and he is just an all-around outstanding guy. So if you don't know Ryan, um, which if you're in Nashville, you probably do, but if you don't know Ryan, uh, be sure to reach out to him and uh, his firm, Aprio, and get to know him because he's an absolutely great guy. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is awesome, man. I really appreciate you taking the time to be here and talk all things accounting industry. Yeah, man, I appreciate appreciate the kind words. I, uh, you know, I just tell people I'm just Ryan, right? Like at the end of the day, like, you know, people give me compliments. I, I have a hard time taking those, but I just, uh, you know, I treat people the way I want to be treated. And, um, you know, yeah, man, there's a lot of things going on in this world right now. I mean, the public accounting industry is crazy. So I've uh, been meeting with a lot of people on pipeline issues and recruiting issues and growth and all kinds of stuff. So it's a, it's a pretty crazy uh, industry right now. So. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you're not familiar with the industry, you didn't come up in the industry like I did and like Ryan still is is practicing in it. You know, like he said, there's there's a lot going on um, and you actually kind of see it if you're on Twitter and, and some of the you know message boards there, um, you can kind of see the commentary around it and what's going on in the industry and whatnot, even if you don't, you know, focus on your, your feed isn't focused on on that. So. We'll kind of dive in. Um, and I, the way I wanted to start it with you today, Ryan, is the, the industry is a little bit unique in that your whole career is based doing these procedures, either the tax or the audit, the advisory, whatever it might be. Um, and then you, as you work your way up, you know, you start to become a little bit more client facing. And before you know it, you're in a role like yourself where you're a partner and you're running the local national office of a larger firm. What has that transition been like for you in terms of shifting responsibilities from more of, hey, I'm showing up, I'm doing something that is more or less the same day in and day out to I'm focused more on strategic planning, you know, business development, operational type role. What's that been like for you? Yeah, I mean, I think a couple of things. So, I mean, as of today, I've still not given up my audit practice. So, you know, I'm still managing a significant book of audit work as well. So this has kind of been on top of that. So I think for me, the, the hardest, most difficult thing right now is finding that balance. And, and I talked to a leader, um, kind of my, I guess, direct report boss um, within the firm the other day. And I said, look, where I need your help is figuring out that balance, right? So is there a target number that the firm is looking like? looking at for me to manage from a, an audit book perspective on top of all of the um, administrative relational business development things I'm doing within the office. And every day I've started to learn that there's way more to this leadership role than I think I even thought there was um, because people do ultimately look at you, right? To get them answers, you know, march them through some daily decisions, some, you know, yearly decisions, and then potentially career decisions if they look at you in a mentor role. Um, you know, something weird. I mean, I never thought I would be doing this, but uh, Wednesday I went and toured five office spaces because we're looking for a new lease. And so it's part of my responsibility to find the next Aprio location in Nashville what that looks like. And then I'll get to work through the build out process. Right. So it's like, I'm also like a real estate broker of, of, of you know, some kind, I guess. And um, so I think really for me at this point though, it's, it's figuring out that balance. It comes with, it comes with excitement, but it also comes with a lot more stress. Uh, I, won't, I won't deny that aspect of it, but at the core of everything I do, um, both, as the leader of the office and the audit practice is people. And for me, it's how are my people um, doing? What is their mindset? Are they happy with their job? Are they, you know, is there anything I can do to make their life easier? Um, and so that's my main focus. My number one concern is, is my team. It's just that team has now grown from, you know, five to six audit you know, team members here in the city to, I mean, we, right now, I think the last number I saw were like 67 in the middle Tennessee market um, of total employees. And so, um, 
you know, that that's all I've always been a big people person and that's through relationships with clients, team members, all the like. And so, um, you know, if you, if you treat people well, the rest of the stuff will work out. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, that definitely comes through. And I think of our time working together, um, and you, you, you weren't even in our side of the business, but during tax season, we'd be up there grinding away and, uh, you know, a happy face comes up and starts joking around. It makes, makes the world a lot better, uh, and a lot manageable, a lot more manageable when you're working long hours. Um, but when I think about what I do and my role, and I think about the shift of mindset back and forth between more high level strategic thinking and then still in the details. And it sounds like maybe you're in that same area where you still have to, you know, do the audit procedures and, and are managing that audit book, but you also have to be more strategic. That is a, that is a mindset shift that I think is incredibly underrated and you can do one and you can do the other, but going back and forth gets really difficult. Um, How's your experience been with that? Well, and, and you know this as well as anybody, right? Like we have, we have peaks and valleys in our year, right? So you've got the busy times, the slower times, the busy times, although I would say mine's more now, it's either busy or it's at least steady. There's not a lot of slow times, but um, the hard part to juggle your ride is, all right, especially like in a tax audit world, right? Like January to April, super busy, right? Like we all know that. You can't put down the strategy though. And that's that's the thing I'm, I'm working through is, all right, I know I've got all these audits that have got to meet deadlines, but I've also got to keep, you know, the focus on the market, the focus on our, what's our business development plan. Because as soon as let's say May 1st hits, we got to go back out and, and plant more seeds. Right. So hopefully we're planting those seeds though, January to April so that we have food to harvest in May and going forward. Right. So it's like, all right, plant the seeds. That's kind of what I've determined is January to April's, you know, you try to grab lunches, you try to grab breakfast, a quick Zoom call with people to ultimately, you know, be able to have like some real sit downs come May and June. And especially in our world, um, right, people that have a current service provider, they've spent a lot of time with that service provider January to April to get mm-hmm. their whatever their deliverable looks like out the door. Well, as soon as that's over, with, they're either happy or they're not. And if they're not, I need to be there, right, to cushion the blow, right? And so hopefully, you know, if I've met people along the way, once we get to the summer, it's time like, all right, what did your service provider do well or not do well? If they didn't do something well, what can I do to hopefully step into that place? Um, And then, you know, keeping my people focused the same way. Um, You know, a lot of people in my industry um, are CPAs, typical CPAs at, at the core, right? They're, they're the, the practitioners who are great at, you know, advising clients and stuff of, of that nature, but they're maybe not the biggest extroverted individuals who want to get out and sell and do those kind of things. So it's, it's finding ways to help and coach them to get out and help execute that plan along with you. Yeah, absolutely. What about more on, you know, the financial management side of the business, right? Like people, meet us as CPAs and they're like, oh, you know, you're great at running businesses, but we go in and and a little bit different because I was on the tax side and audit and you're on audit, but, um, you know, it's just a different level of evaluation, if you will, uh, and analysis. What about in terms of running, you know, your local Nashville office has, has created a mind shift for you, uh, and focusing on something completely different than going out and performing an audit on an industry that could be completely unrelated. Yeah, for sure. So, um, somebody said, so, so a mentor of mine at craft from, let's say, I mean, honestly, at this point, it's probably 14 years ago. Right. Um, a guy named Tommy Francis, he was a partner, um, probably even before your time there. He, uh, he said to me one thing that that's kind of always stuck. He said, you know, Ryan, he said, you know, doing audits is what generates the revenue. But number one, first and foremost, I'm a business owner. And he said that was the day that I became a partner that had that mindset had to shift. Right. Yes, I've got to focus on bringing in the revenue to increase the top line. But I've also got the rest of the income statement I've got to manage. Right. And the Mm -hmm. assets of the balance sheet of your business. And so um, we have a fundamental here at Aprio. It's called think and act like an owner. 
right? And so what that tries to encourage our people to do is throughout your decision making, whether it's, I mean, something as simple as like, all right, where do I go to lunch today? Do I go to uh, a swanky place like Bourbon Steak for a lunch and take a prospect? Or do I, you know, take them to, you know, let's call it Dobird down the street. So it's still a nice enough place, but it's not breaking the bank of the firm, right? And so it's just, it's causing us to, to have a steward mindset to the resources that the firm has. And so, um, you know, for instance, and this is something that wild that happened recently. So all the bills of the office go through, you know, a, a bill paying process online. And so I get kicked invoices um, through that process. And this invoice comes through and it was from one of the local um, like printer maintenance software companies. It had a list, it was like a thousand dollar bill. It had a list of like 10 printers in the office. And I'd never seen one of them since I'd been the leader of the office. I was like, you know what? I'm going to print this invoice off and I'm going to go and just, you know, the auditor in me is like, I'm going to go check to make sure we actually have these printers. So I go through checking the boxes. And first of all, we, we didn't have one of the ones that was on the list. So we were going to pay for a printer that we didn't even have. And then secondly, so I told my assistant, I said, hey, call, call this company and get them you know, to remove this printer and say, Hey, we don't have it anymore. And then I'll approve the invoice. Well, they called and they said, Hey, we don't, we have a contract with you guys. But we haven't even serviced you in like 40 years. So come to find out we've been since Aprio bought the firm that it acquired here in Nashville, we've been paying basically a thousand dollars a month for this contract. Now, granted, we would have been obligated through the contract either way, even if we wouldn't have canceled because it was a termed contract. Now, and the buyout was basically the same amount. So it, it didn't really wind up costing us any more money. But what we figured out was like, we've been paying this contract. Nobody had any idea. And then they weren't even servicing it. Like the guy said, literally the last time they had been out was 2020 to service yeah. one of the funders. And so just, just, oh, you know, but, but again, back to that financial management, something as simple as, is like truly evaluating an invoice and like being a steward of the resources. And, and, and it, what it wound up figuring out was we could cancel the contract now, like we were within a certain window. So we were at least able to save a little bit of money on the back end because mm -hmm. we have a national contract with a printing company. And so like the firm is paying nationwide for this service contract, but yet here in Nashville, we were also paying for this other one. And so, um, but yeah, again, back to that, I mean, you know, you know, being a steward of the resources, but then it's, it's as simple as, right. Your people are asking for raises and things like, so you gotta, you have to de decide, right. Are you going to be an advocate for that person? Cause ultimately like a lot of our stuff is headquartered, you know, at HQ and centralized to that. But, you know, people come to me and it's like, well, Ron, I, I, you know, I deserve a raise. And so I have to sit down and, and evaluate the amount of money that maybe that person should get. Is it reasonable? Are, are, are they really actually entitled to that? Then I have to go make a, a business case um, to HQ to to get that money, and so that that part's been a little interesting. Is like I'm a lot more involved, I think, in the financial budgeting and operations in the office too. I think than I even knew I would be just based on our corporate structure. So yeah, you're you're getting to see the other side of the things as you know true employees that we would talk about, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. which is which is both good and bad. Um, but maybe it makes sense when you get onto the other side, like the reasons why decisions were made, um, yeah, you know, fair. when we were complaining or whatever. Um, what about the regulatory environment, the change there? I mean, yeah. accounting can be seen as slow and, and boring and we'll get into, you know, perceptions and stuff uh, here in a little bit, but I don't think people realize how quickly things change within the regulatory environment in the accounting industry. What's, what's kind of been your experience like keeping up with that? Has it changed since, you know, you took over an office versus like yeah. we said earlier, just practicing audit? You know, I, I, we had a, we had this intern meet and greet yesterday. And so it was like, you know, we've got 29 offices across the world. So it was like, Hey, let's we'll bring some leaders together to meet some of the interns in other offices, just so they get to, you know, have a conversation, ask questions around, you know, career opportunities and stuff like that. So I was talking to one of them and I said, you know, for me, the regulatory environment and the change is one of the reasons I fell in love with this industry because I knew ultimately I would learn until the day I walked out of the, and retired. Um, I always tell a story. There was a, a 
partner that I used to work with probably let's call it 10 years ago. We had the situation with a client. Um, it was a little bit more complicated situation they had had in their business. Um, and I'd never dealt with one. And so go in his office, this gentleman's probably 62 at the time. And I said, Hey, I said, how are we going to handle this? And he looked at me and he said, Ron, I don't know. He said, I've been in this industry 40 years. I've never done one of these. He goes, so let's, let's go dig in and figure out what it needs to look like. And so at that point though, I knew that there would be an, always be an evolution of my learning, right? I, I could be a lifelong learner in this work, but we were even talking again, you know, related to what you were asking and, and like, right, we got an election coming up this year, right? I mean, there's a high likelihood that one way or the other, there's going to be at least some tweaks to the tax code, right? Absolutely. An election doesn't go by that that doesn't happen. Um, they have to make an executive decision. Does it make sense to completely overhaul it, right? Like in prior years where you had the, you know, the Trump tax act and those kind of things, but you know, who, who so who knows um, what that necessarily will look like, but I think that those are the kind of things that are where we're, we're able to show our value, right? Like the individual who's preparing their tax return can't go out and ultimately um, keep up with all that information, right? And so I think that's that's the cool thing for us. I always say, you know, it's the, those are the kind of things that keep us employed, right? And keep mm -hmm. us getting paid. Um, and and then in the on the audit, like you know, accounting standards side of things. You know, there's there's this constant evolution and shift to um, aligning U.S. GAAP with international standards. And, um, you know, there was, you know, there was an, some things where they tried to get them just to come together conjunctively, but that just hasn't happened. But, but every year we see something come out where we're inching closer and closer to that. And so um, there's always new standards. Um, I mean, but again, for me, that's just another thing to have to keep up with, right? Mm -hmm. Like I get emails every day, Hey Ron, there's going to be a webcast on this new standard. You need to make sure you're on it. Right. And so, um, for me, it's, it's, but also those add opportunities to talk to my clients, which is cool. Um, cause I'm always looking for reasons to get in front of them, whether it's, um, just to see how their business is doing. Um, whether it's, I've come up with a new idea or service of offering that I could give them, um, or, you know, it's created through, um, you know, regulatory changes or, or standard changes too. So, yeah. And, and not only is it a good opportunity to get in front of your current clients, but as I've seen, you know, on my side, it's a really good opportunity for you to do some business development work and say, Hey, yeah. this new standard came out. You're not a client of ours, but we're on top of this. This is how we can add value, um, which you guys are certainly on top of and, and we appreciate, um, so let's switch gears just a, a little bit. Um, still something that you deal with in, in your role as a uh, managing partner of the office, um, but maybe a little bit more detailed than any of the, the topics we've talked, to, talked about so far. And I want to dive into staffing trends um, because I don't know that this gets, I, I see it on Twitter and I don't, I don't follow a ton of like CPA stuff. So, but it still pops up. Um, yeah. And it's, it's crazy. I mean, when, when you really dig in, I think I saw a stat the other day that like when I was graduating college, which has been over a decade at this point, um, there were like 50,000 people. Um, don't quote me on the stats, but like 50,000 people sitting for the CPA exam. And now there's something like 30,000. Um, yeah. And if you go through Twitter, everyone has their own opinion sure. as to why. Um, and I think like most things, it's not black and white. It's probably a conglomerate of all of those opinions. Uh, but I wanted to get, you know, your thoughts on what has created this um, supply demand shock to yeah. the CPA world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, this is actually really timely that you're asking me this. So uh, I sat down the other day with a professor at a university and he's doing sort of a research paper, um, doing some, some kind of background work with a gentleman um, who used to be a, a partner at a big four. He's done some work for the ASCPA, but he's also, they're kind of teaming up on this white paper. And so he was just polling different CPAs and different CPA firms. Um, and this is also one thing like our firm is very integrally involved in. So um, our um, mid-Atlantic region leader and, and current board member, Lexi Kessler, she is, um, she's the president elect of the ASCPA board of trustees. 
So she'll be the, the chairman next year, but she's also leading a task force. Um, it's basically the pipeline initiative, essentially. And so they've done numerous years of research and, and hopefully that we can unite the industry around hopefully the causes as well as the resolutions. Right. And so, um, you know, I, I can't speak for everybody. Ryan's opinion is a couple of different things. Um, our profession, I think probably for a long time was viewed as just not cool or fun. Right. I think there's some of that. Right. I mean, at the end of the day, right. As a teenager, right. How many times did you make a decision based on something you thought was maybe you bought a new pair of shoes because it was the new trend or whatever. Right. I mean, I'm not saying that you should make a career decision that way, but if that's all, you know, right. Like that's, that may be part of your decision. It's like, all right, what, what's out in the market, especially now what's on social media, all the different things. And, and, and then I think, you know, I, I, I mean, clearly finances play a huge part in this. And I didn't really know the, the whole statistic, but I mean, I don't mind speaking numbers because it, it doesn't matter. But in 2008, I started in public accounting at $50,000 a year. That starting salary rate for probably 12 to 13 years. So from 08 to probably 2001, I mean, 20, 2021, excuse me probably only climbed from 50 to 55, 56,000 mm dollars. -hmm. So if you do the math, right, like that's like $500 a year, like that's not much of an increase. And then over the last like couple of years, like it's even like the big four, like I heard the other day, like they're paying 65 to start. So even, even right, 15 and 17 years is not a massive increase, right? Mm -hmm. Um, especially with the cost of living, inflation, interest rates, right? Like, I mean, especially living here in Nashville, right? I mean, we know what housing costs. I mean, right. It's not cheap. And so, um, and I've tried to figure out what's the root cause of that. Right. And, and there's a couple of things. I mean, I think at the end of the day, um, people like me have chosen in the past to not want to take a pay cut, right? Like partners. Right. Like I, I've said it for years, even before I was a partner. Right. The, there's only two ways that this problem gets solved. Partners got to take a pay cut or we as an industry have to go back and adjust our fee structure. And, and that's something, you know, I always say um, attorneys have done a great job at valuing themselves. Um, they for years have stuck together. At the end of the day, my rate is X. And if you don't want to pay it, you're going to go next door and you're going to get the same rate, right? Like there's not going to be a significant fluctuation in the, in the pricing at the attorney level, but in the CPA market, for some reason, we've decided let's race to the bottom. Right. And, and I think that causes a couple of things, right? Inherently, um, even if we race to the bottom just to get the work in the door, we're not going to make money on that work because our costs are high, right? And then we're probably not going to give good service because that client, we're not making any money on it. And I've seen that in a couple of prospects I've gotten recently where I sit down with them and I, I, I give them my quote, right? And what is a reasonable quote for me where I can make money, but not also not gouge them. And they look at me in the face and they're like, well, this is way more than I'm paying today. But I have to guide them and say, like, what, what's the reason you're changing? Right? Like, why are you? And it's like, well, I'm not getting good service. And I'm like, well, you're not getting good service because you're not paying for it. And that firm doesn't really value your business. Mm -hmm. Like at the end of the day, they, yeah, you're going to get your deliverable, maybe on time, maybe not, but you're not going to get that extra additional advisory value, um, timely responsiveness, those kinds of things. And so, yeah, my cost is greater, but my hope is to meet you where you want to be. Right. Like I, I want to give you the service that you deserve and value, but also, right. I mean, at the end of the day, like I said, I'm a business owner and, and I've got to make money, but, um, the CPA world is very interesting. And I think we're, we're at a really at a crossroads and, and it's, um, you know, a lot of the bigger firms are, are offshoring to, I mean, my firm included, I mean, we, we bought a firm in the Philippines. We have 300 employees that sit over there that, um, I mean, do fantastic work, but, it, we've we've had so much growth from a revenue perspective. We had to do it because 
we didn't have the people here domestically to complete the work because of the shortage, right? And so, I mean, even as much money as we pump into recruiting and, you know, you know, fees for, you know, headhunting and those kind of things to go get new employees, you know, we're just not finding the talent. And, and then it's weird because firms are, you know, firms, firms fight to the bottom for clients, but they're fighting to the top for staff, which is great. But then what happens within a year when you can't pay those people, right? Mm-hmm. Like you've, you've, you know, to get them in the door, you've raised their, their salaries, but yet you're fighting to the bottom to get clients. And then, you know, so that, that's going to be an interesting trend in the market as well. Yeah. And it's, it's, um, you know, obviously salaries, I think you touched on a little bit. It has this perception of being a little boring and not cool. Yeah. Um, the long hours, I think, have historically yeah. been been a problem. And then you've got uh, w- w- the fourth one I think I see the most is the 150 hour CPA requirement. Yeah. Um, because you're talking, you know, a whole another year of school to get yeah. that requirement. Um, then sit down for a, a, an exam that doesn't have the, you know, you know, the best chances of a, a high success rate in terms of passing. Um, and then, you know, coming out as a first year and making less than, you know, the finance and tech friends that you have that, that go that direction. So, you know, I, I don't think it's any one thing. I think at least in my opinion, um, you know, all those things kind of interact with yeah. each other in yeah. a way that, um, has created this, this problem out of, yeah. Maybe not out of nowhere, but it just kind of seems to have came came all of a sudden, um, yeah. if you will. Well, and and you talk about the exam, so that was part of the conversation I had, and I've also been doing some digging. So Minnesota, the state of Minnesota, actually the other day um, passed a resolution to drop the Minnesota um, requirement to one hundred and twenty. So, and then there's come to find out the 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 NASBUS of the National Accounting State Board, you know, Association State Board of Accountancy. Um, for so long, they said they were going to die on the hill of the 150, right? So, like at the end of the day, that was going to be the requirement. And now, but now, what they're decided they're going to the hill they're going to die on is reciprocity. And so, like right, like at the end of the day, Minnesota's dropped theirs to 120, but that's the only place you can practice, right? Because if every other state has a different requirement, so mm-hmm. ultimately at this point, what they're working on, and and this affects a lot of things. It's not just the CPA landscape, right? It's higher education. Right. It's student loans. It's right. Like it's, it's financial in nature. And, and that was one of the conversations we had is, all right, if, if it's 120, what happens to masters of accountancy programs? Mm-hmm. Right. Like how many people are actually going to go get a master in accountancy? I mean, I, I think you have one. From I do. From this, correct. Right. Yeah. Like you did that to go sit for the CPA exam. You maybe wouldn't have spent that extra whatever amount of money to go get that degree. And so, you know, that affects the, you know, the dollars and cents of the universities. And, and so, you know, there's a lot of things at play here that they're talking through currently. And, and one thing we've actually done from a financial perspective is we've partnered with a university. Um, so if you were one of our interns and you want to get the 150, but you, you're like, man, like, you know, 40 to $50,000 is impactful, right? Um, we've partnered with a university where we will pay basically for you to get the classes. So you don't, you don't get a master's degree at the end of it, but you get like a certificate. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's some universities that are looking at doing that where it's like, yeah, we'll add a couple of higher level accounting classes, but really it's just the requirements to get to that 150 there. It's fairly short term in nature. Um, it's, they've made it relatively inexpensive. And so that's a partnership with the AICPA as well. Um, so, I mean, I think there's a lot of avenues that people are looking at. Um, I will say, I, I, my hope is that it doesn't devalue the CPA. And I think that's been people's fear. Um, you know, cause I remember when I passed 15 years ago, I, you know, I looked at my wife and I said, you know, honey, I may not always have the perfect job or the job that I want, but I know with this security, I'll always have a job. Right. And so, you know, that was a good feeling. Um, there is something proud to be, you know, to say like, I, you know, studied, I took this test, I put in all these hours and then, you know, that there's a benefit to that. Right. And, and there's, a, you know, there's something to be said that stands out Well, you're a CPA and there's, there's a mindset, especially I know with 
the older generation, like I tell like my parents, friends that or, or whatever, right? And it's like, there's a pride there. Like they're like, wow, you know, you're a CPA, maybe not as much today as much, but, but for sure, as I was growing up and, and those kind of things. Um, but also the public accounting industry for a long time, it was the carrot, right? We dangled this carrot of partnership and big money, right? I always, you know, yeah, when I came out of college, there weren't a ton of people making $50,000 a year. So that was, that was good money. Like I was pleased to get it all the things, but as I, as I slowly worked up the ladder, I had a ton of friends making more money than I did. And, you know, I'll just speak straight cause that's who I am. Like they weren't more talented than me, more intellectual than me, but maybe they were just in an industry that, you know, kind of rewarded quicker. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and so that was always a frustration of mine, but I knew if I made it to the end, a lot of people wouldn't make the money that I would at the end. People don't care about that as much anymore. Right. It's very much more about today and, and the, the value that I can get today, but also like, you know, people value things differently too, right? <clears throat> like more time off, um, more time with their family, um, flexible work arrangements, right? Like things look different. It's not as much about the dollar. And so I think we do have to find a balance there as well. I mean, you, you mentioned it earlier and I don't, we didn't, we kind of jumped over it, but like the long hours, like that's, and honestly, that's not appealing to me either. I mean, yeah. right. Like I understand like at my role, like there's just, I don't have a set schedule and that just kind of is what it is. But, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to beat my team into the ground. Right. And so I do think we do a good job of setting expectations and providing flexibility. You know, at the end of the day, we, we, we don't have huge mandatory hour requirements I mean, we have mandatory requirements, but they're not what you and I've seen in the industry. Right. And mm -hmm. so um, I think we do a pretty good job of trying to balance that in line with getting the work done, but it's tough. Cause we talked about that. Like if I cut everybody back to 40 hours, I either have to go hire more or we have to have real conversations with our clients. Like, look, this isn't going to be the like unrealistic expectations that we've had over the years. Right. Like I've got employees that are going to work 40 hours and we're going to get your work done. But in the past, we've only been able to do that by everybody working a bunch of overtime. Right. And so we either have to staff up. So we spend more money or we've got to have realistic conversations with clients, which we don't like to do right sometimes is in the industry. Um, so there's a lot of interesting variables right now, I won't lie. Yeah, for sure. It gets very circular as you sit down and have the conversation. And before we, we move on to that, you know, obviously I think about it from my perspective and why I'm not in the industry anymore. And you and I have talked about this offline before. You know, obviously the long hours and the pay and those things have, they play their role. But as, yes. I, as I said earlier, like it was a combination of all of it. And one of the things that, um, I think impacted me and maybe I haven't seen discussed as much as some of these other variables that we've mentioned is that it was so structured in that it didn't really matter how hard you worked. You still moved up at a relative same speed until a certain point as everyone else, right? Like sure. at two to four years, you become a senior at four to six years, you become a supervisor at six to eight years, you become a manager. Um, and I don't know that I've seen that talked about as much as yeah. I have some of these other other variables. Have you have you guys started having those conversations internally? Because, you know, for me, it was like, OK, well, we can we can have conversations and we can try to fix the pay and you can go in and, and you can argue for yourself. You can, you know, set boundaries and uh, cut yourself back on hours or, or talk to your manager and kind of get that more manageable. Um, you know, you can't really fix the CPA requirement. But the one thing that I couldn't get over is like, hey, man, I, I'm look at my peers. I'm here. I'm working 100 hour weeks. They're working 60. Yeah. If you combine, you know, on a on a pro rata basis, like I should be moving up at nearly double the speed that they are. Um, yeah. You guys talk about that internally at all? Yeah, 100 percent. And I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, I had a very similar problem, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was it was and granted, I will say this, you know, it's firm to firm because I think there's also a, a, a structure of opportunity, right, that certain firms can create at the top that not all can. Um, so I think depending on where you're at, you, you, you are slowed down because 
you know, even if you get to the, the level before the level, right. You can't, you can't get there. Um, I will say this, it has been eye opening, right? I think Aprio does a really great job of recognizing our performers and, you know, identifying them early enough to where we can pour in and we can get them to the top. I mean, we made, I think it was last year, we made two or three partners with nine years experience, like 32 years old. Yeah. And like, I mean, by the time, I mean, you know, by the time I was 32, I mean, heck, I'm not even sure I'd sniff senior manager at that point, not because maybe I wasn't ready, but just because there either wasn't a space or like you said, there was this, you know, put in the amount of time. And like you said, though, right, we all put in, we put in the equivalent amount of time, but right. it was difficult, right? And, and, and granted, looking back on it, I mean, I, I understand theoretically why some of those things happened to you and I, uh, doesn't make it any easier, right? But I think um, because of, of being at a place where we can, you know, where we grow significantly and we create opportunities, um, you can reward those high performers much quicker, um, which is really cool to see because, you know, typically people like you and I, people like those people that are going to make it at, at that nine year mark, right? Like they're overachievers, mm -hmm. right? Like they've, and, and so they want reward and they want challenges. And that's really what people discount is that, all right, I spend three years at manager and seven years at senior manager. Well, after year two or three, right? Like it becomes repetitive, right? Like you're, you're working on the same jobs, you're doing the same thing, but like that move to partners, not just financial, it's all right. I've got a whole new level of responsibilities and challenges and things that will drive me. Right. Like I drove hard to get to this point, but now, I mean, the, the business landscape is kind of my challenge at this point. And so um, I think we have to keep, you know, finding ways to challenge those people. And that's one of the ways we do it is through promotion and, and movement. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think those are all, all good points. So now let's think of it. Well, first, I guess, as I said earlier, it is helpful, you know, to be now on the other side and you can kind yeah. of see, like, yeah. I, I don't want this to come off as bashing the industry or any of the, yeah. the folks that, came before us, you can see now that you're on the other side, you can kind of see why decisions were made the way that they were made. And you can't always see that when yes. you're not in that position. Uh, but then on switching gears just a little bit, if you're a business owner and you're listening to this conversation, the one thing that you might be hearing is my fees are going to go up, you know, yeah. like uh, they're, they're having staffing issues. The, dem sure. the demand is still high. Yeah. You know, the, the demand for accounting services, whether it's audit tax, whatever, are still high and, and growing yeah. and you're having these staffing issues. You know, you've got to be able to pay your people. You've got to find a way to strike this work-life balance or it's just going to continue to get more and more difficult to find good people. What do you say to those business owners that are worried about their fees going up and looking at someone like Aprio to come in and, and play a role? Like yeah. what's the value there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that is, I mean, that is a fair question. And that's something that um, we are super hyper focused on is, I mean, I really believe at the end of the day, you when you write your check to pay me, you should feel like that you paid nothing. Because at the end of the day, I provided you at minimum, the value of what you're paying me. And so I, I take that approach with additional services. So one of the reasons I came to a firm this size was the ability to offer my clients any of their, their needs financially. I mean, honestly, we offer operational you know, needs, all the different things, technology, things that I could offer them, but I will, you know, I will not take solutions to my clients unless I can provide them at minimum a five X. And, uh, you know, it, it doesn't do me any good to take you a new service that's going to cost you, let's say, $10,000. And, yeah, it's $10,000 in my pocket. But at the, if at the end of it, you're like, well, that didn't really change anything for me one way or the other. So 
even when my managers and I'm having these conversations with them, because, you know, I've got my people who are at the, the front line of the, you know, the operations of, of my clients and the accounting function, I say, look, don't, don't even bring up something unless you can sit down with me and show me that we can, if they pay 10 grand, then they're going to get $50,000 worth of value. And so I want it to be apparent again, that when you write that check, you, um, you don't even, you don't even think about it, right? Like I wrote Ryan this check cause you know, I paid Ryan 50 grand and the audit, he found ways to, to get me a hundred thousand dollars worth of value. Mm -hmm. Like I, I really want that to be the answer. And, and, and I want, I think part of it is we don't have that advisory mindset in the CPA world a lot, but that is something that Abrio is hyper-focused on. So we, we don't actually consider ourselves a CPA firm. Um, we call ourselves a CPA led advisory firm. Um, and so our goal is to sit down with our clients, evaluate their status today, right? Where is your business today? Where has it been? But more importantly, where is it going and where do you want it to go? And our tagline is something that permeates throughout that, and that's passionate for what's next. And so for us, it's taking that and figuring out where we can walk side by side with you to get you to your next. And, and the biggest compliment I've ever received in my career, um, I had a client that said, Ron, I look at you as part of our management team. And so you're not an outside third party. You are us. And so that should be my goal for every one of my clients is to walk hand in hand with them. And, and I love nothing more than s success stories for my clients. Like I want them to achieve anything and everything that, that they dream um, in the same way that I hope they do that for me. And so, um, yeah, I mean, if fees go up, which I mean, maybe that is the answer, right? I mean, I, I don't know hundred percent what the answer is, I mean, we're definitely looking for other ways to where that's not the answer, right? Maybe there's ways we can um, save save money on our end that ultimately leverages it. But, um, you know, and, and I will say, you know, not to dive too far into this, but um, that may happen because industry consolidation too, right? Like, I mean, I think everybody sees that in the CPA landscape as well. Um, so, so we'll see. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, my goal is always to be um, a value add, not a value suck. And so, um, you know, hopefully my clients see that when they meet with me and then ultimately once I do my job, they see those results. Yeah. Very well said. If you're a CPA firm, um, sell your services like Ryan, um, very, very well said and very well, um, articulated. So then we've talked about all these issues and let's maybe dive into more of what could be a potential solution, but it is also a double-edged sword and that's tech. Yeah. Um, and what I mean by it being a double-edged sword, it's very expensive as you well know. Yeah. Um, but I was literally asked yesterday by one of my coworkers, he sits two desks over from me. He said, how long until AI um, does all of our tax returns? Yeah. I don't know, man. I mean, this has been a conversation since I joined the industry. Yeah. Is it becoming more real? I think so. I think so. It's it's becoming more real across all businesses. Um, but I still think we're a long way away from that. And it doesn't solve some of these other issues like, uh, you know, the supply demand from staffing and things like that immediately. It may over time give it 20 years. Yeah, it may write itself. Um, but it hasn't yet. And I don't I don't see it fully correcting it in the next five to 10. Yeah. Uh, but what are you seeing on that? you know, tech side of things, you know, how, how is it impacting the industry? Um, you know, will it fix the staffing problem? Um, or is that always going to be kind of at play and, and we have to fix some of these other solutions or other problems first? What, what are your thoughts there? I mean, I think everybody views it differently. Um, I think I personally hope it is done in unison with, right? Like we definitely have some core issues that we need to fix, right? The, salaries, the, the long hours, the, you know, figure out whatever we're going to do with the CPA exam. Right. But I think about technology, not just from a, yes, I mean, we're investing in it heavily. Um, actually we had an audit partner call the other day about two new things we're bringing online. And, and when we get pitched the ability to, 
you know, buy a technology, they always tell us how many hours it's going to save, right? Because at the end of the day, and so like this new one was, I mean, something as simple as AR confirmations, right? Like if you're a business owner, maybe you're a CFO, like it gets audited, right? Like you've seen that, like people, people send AR confirmations out to verify balances. And this one, the, the tagline was like, this will save you. Basically, it was one person. So like, you're going to invest X, but, but it's going to, but it's going to save you, let's call it, you know, $80,000 in staff cost or whatever. And so, you know, we kind of had those conversations. Um, but also I think technology makes our industry appealing too, because the, the younger people, I hate to sound like an old person, but like the younger people are intrigued by technology, mm -hmm. right? And so if they get to operate AI in these new softwares, maybe that, maybe it all kind of solves itself together, right? Like, all right, well, these are some cool things that we're doing over here in the accounting world, right? And so um, do I think, I don't think it will ever eliminate the human, right? Like we're always going to have to have people that are, especially like at the manager and partner level, right? Like, yeah, maybe AI eliminates some menial tasks, but honestly, our staff don't like doing those things anyways, right? Like, you're, you're, you know, for you as a tax practitioner in, in life's past, right? Like, yeah, you didn't like plugging in all the 1099 information. You didn't want to do that. What you wanted to do it ultimately get to was like, all right, can I look at my, my client's tax return? Is there ways I can help them save money? Can I, you know, what value can I add? I mean, mm -hmm. I think people inherently want to do that. They don't want to do the data entry stuff. So I do think, yeah, over time, AI will help with that. And honestly, it's been doing it for years, right? Like there's, there's, you know, programs like for tax work, like sure prep. So like, you know, you scan in all the 1099s and basically it data entries, all the stuff for you, right? Like there's certain softwares that, you know, even the staff get a tax return that's 80% filled out when they get it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so I think, yeah, they're, they're going to be, especially over time as we, we evolve and get smarter and more technology, like it's going to start to eliminate those menial tasks, but hopefully that's ways that we can also maybe save our clients, right? Like we're going to invest some, but I think what will be interesting to see is what the profession does with that from a market value, right? Like, all right, yeah, we're spending a lot of money up front and I can, I can tell you that bill is big. Um, but how do we value bill for that? Right? Like, or is that just another way for us to race to the bottom? Well, I cut time so I can cut my fee. But like, if you're really smart about it, right? Like we're the ones that have invested our own capital to bring in that technology. So maybe it did cut a hundred, you know, 50 hours of our time on an engagement, but how do we, how do we bill for that? Right? Like, how is that, you know, accounted for as a business owner? Like, right? Like, how do we spread that out across all our engagements? How do we determine what that cut is, right? And so, um, so that that's something I think will be interesting. Um, but again, I think I think it, it provides us a little bit of an edge too in, in the in the recruiting game. I think like it's not just debits and credits, or it's not just you know ten ninety nines and W twos. It's software and AI and and all the things. And so, my hope is that that we can merge those two in in the right way so that um, not only does it attract people, um, but maybe it does cut our long hours down. Maybe that's really the answer there is, is it, it excites people, but it also takes us from a 55 hour work week back to a 40 hour work week or a 32 hour work week. Right. And yeah. Um, so we'll see. No, those are all good points. One, one thing I did think of when, you were talking through all that that I hadn't necessarily thought of before was with the shift to more of a technology driven industry. It also has a potential to fix that whole thing that I was saying earlier. If you only move up at a certain speed, because let's be real here for a second, younger people tend to have a little bit different experience um, with the up and coming new technology than some of us that have been, you know, doing something a little, a little bit different, if you will. Yeah. Um, and so you can come in and you can add a little bit different value uh, yeah. early on in your career. Then, yeah. like you said, when I came in, my first two years, three years, whatever it was of public accounting, I was data entry, you know? Yeah. Like that's one of the things that really annoyed me is that, okay, I wanna be involved. I wanna talk to the client pre-filing their tax return and I wanna provide value to them. Otherwise, what am I doing? Like there's yeah. just, 
like, what am, what am I getting out of this? I'm just going in, I'm entering numbers into a system and then I'm told to, to fix them. Um, but technology, I think, I think you're right, has the ability to change that from a staffing and, and growth perspective to, okay, I can come out of college. I can add value to my firm and I can add value to my clients much earlier than I could prior, um, which I think is a, an interesting note that I hadn't really, really thought of there. Well, I hope, right, like for people that have a hard time justifying paying more, maybe that's something that helps that too, right? Like, because I mean, honestly, for me, like I, I want to pay people as much as I can. Like, honestly, I genuinely do. Like, um, I, I want to make impacts with people and with families. And if that, if there's a way I can pay more, I, I want to. And so, you know, if, if that helps people that can't quite wrap their head around that, do that. Like, hey, look, these people are coming out with a different skill set, right? Like, I mean, it's, I mean, granted, just speaking straight again, like we had a new technology come out last, last summer. And I was like, oh man, just something else I got to learn, right? And so I really, I mean, I went to my team, just quite honest with you. And I was like, hey guys, like, I need y'all to just figure this out and then tell me what I need to know, right? Like I, I, I just didn't have the bandwidth to be able to dive into that. But for them, it's like, it's stuff they've been kind of looking at and dealing with since college, right? And like, yeah, I miss that gap, right? In education like that. I mean, yes, I've tried to keep up as much as possible along the way, but that wasn't something I learned in a classroom setting. Mm -hmm. And so they did, whether they, you know, part of their, you know, part of their stuff was taking an IT centered class or data analytics, um, you know, modeling courses or things, things of that nature that, that I didn't get, you know, 20 plus years ago or whatever. Right. And so, um, you know, I, I mean, yeah, I, I'm going to need those people going forward, right? And so For hopefully sure. that um, maybe will justify to some maybe of the older school mindset the the extra expense to get those talented individuals in the door. So. Yeah, I laugh all the time because coming out of college, everyone learn Excel, learn Excel, like yeah. become a master of Excel. Like everyone preached Excel and we are not too far away from typing in some instructions and it not having to know how to build these formulas and and build tables and charts and stuff because it's going to do it for you and yeah. along that same breath you know as you're evaluating tech in whatever industry or business that you're in not only are you evaluating that tech as it is right now but you're also evaluating tech much more soon much more futuristic tech than you were prior right so maybe in the accounting world, we'll use that since that's what we're talking about. You were evaluating a tech software as it stands now and seeing if that could last you the next five or 10 years. It's changing so rapidly now that you're evaluating future tech that isn't quite there yet, but might be another year or two. So does it make sense to hold off a year because mm -hmm. a new solution is going to come to the table? Um, and I, I think that's a, a real problem as well as there's just the decision-making process um, yeah. and the, the amount of information is just going to come at you much more rapidly than it has in the past. Well, there's so much of it. I mean, there's so much tech, right? And and like you said, it's, it's an evolving thing on a daily basis. And so, yeah, I mean, I think, and I think it's probably the questions hopefully that we're asking, right, is, is like, yeah, what is the return today? But like, all right, what do you, what do you have in the pipeline? Right. Like, are there going to be modules that are going to add on? What what are you seeing over, like you said, over the next five years? Like, what what can I get to on a return and, and that kind of thing? But, um, yeah, it's going to it's going to be interesting. I'm, I'm uh, along for the ride, I guess. So it's uh, um, it's definitely shifting how I think about things. Um, but also yeah, I go back to it's that that always learning mindset. Right. Yeah. It's it's being able to. Um, see new things, dive in and, and, and really, um, continue to learn. It's just an evolution. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap it up. If you're still yeah. with us and you listen to, you know, 54 minutes of accounting, God bless you. Um, <laughs> yeah. but there is a lot going on and yeah. it is more exciting than, uh, I think people realize, I think, um, just to use real estate, since that's the world that I operate in, if you go back to 08, some of the pe places that were impacted the most, um, saw the most growth afterwards because they could start fresh. Um, the accounting industry, I think, saw some very um, impactful uh, COVID 
experiences, right? Like COVID impacted the accounting industry and, and how you guys um, staff and whatnot in a very prominent way. And I think the positive of that is that you will see some amazing growth within the accounting industry. And so if you're listening to this and you're trying to figure out, okay, well, what, what do I want to do with my career? You know, maybe accounting isn't so boring, you know, yeah. maybe, maybe check it out. Um, but that's where we'll end it there. Ryan, thank you for the candid conversation, man. Uh, it's always a pleasure. And I think we have a couple of follow-up topics from this conversation that we could, uh, we could circle back and do this again. Yeah, man. I'd love to appreciate the, uh, Appreciate the time and uh, congratulations on your new family and, and everything you're doing um, personally and professionally and, and all your success. It's cool to see from a, at least from a little, you know, side ledge and, and uh, hope to um, watch you keep going further. So uh, yeah, great to talk to you, buddy. And, and best of luck. I appreciate that, man. God bless.